Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Broadcasting ADHD Europe. I'm Hans van der Velde. I'm Vice President of ADHD Europe and in daily life I work as a coach. I coach employees for employers. Uh, tonight is our guest, Dr. Thomas Brown from Los Angeles, United States. Um, and he will be talking about ADHD and the overlap with autism, a very useful subject, which we will go into in a minute. Uh, first, Filio, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Filio Wilding. I'm a board member of ADHD Europe and the tech leader ADIS. Um, I'll be making sure that everything goes smoothly in the running of this webinar, moving on Thomas's slides and answering your comments in chat on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you have anything to say, please feel free to put a question or a comment in the chat box. Um, you'll see it below your screen or to the right. And we'll do our best to answer you uh, throughout the webinar, particularly in a Q&A section at the end. Uh, in my daily life, as I mentioned, I work for ADIS, um, who are working with ADHD Europe on this webinar. And we're also doing a fundraiser. Thank you for Hans for allowing me to put that out there. So if you'd like to support ADIS and the work we do in the UK with ADHD, there'll be a link to our fundraiser in the chat below from ADHD Europe. And please feel free to click it, give it a share, maybe donate something. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Vilio. Everything for the good purpose, don't we? Uh, well, it's not about us, it's uh, about you, uh, Thomas Brown. Thank you for uh, being present in our webinar. We are very happy to welcome you here, uh, mostly in Europe, but uh, also from other countries. Um, I hope you can introduce yourself first a bit. Sure. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, I am a clinical psychologist uh, trained at Yale University, and I taught for 20 years in the psychiatry department of Yale Medical School. And then I relocated uh, to California, uh, where I opened uh, my own clinic uh, for children and teenagers and adults with ADHD and related problems. Um, and I see patients there five days a week. I've written uh, six books, uh, one new one coming out, uh, which we'll mention at the end of the program. And I'm delighted to uh, be with you today to talk about ADHD and some of the overlapping problems uh, using the example of Asperger's syndrome, although I want to say that I'm using that to designate that I'm looking at the, those on the Asperger's, uh, on the autism spectrum who have uh, at least average or above average uh, IQ. It's a subgroup within the autism spectrum. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Yes, go ahead. Please do. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that there has been considerable change in our understanding of this uh, disorder that we call ADHD. Uh, and it was first written up in the medical literature in English in 1902. But from 1902 until 1980, it was all about just about little boys who couldn't sit still, wouldn't shut up, and were driving everybody nuts. It was not until uh, about 1980 uh, that the term attention deficit was put into the name of the disorder. And what's been happening since then is that we've increasingly begun to realize that what we're looking at here is uh, the brain's self-management system, which we refer to as its executive functions. Slide, please. By the term executive functions, what I'm talking about is a wide range of central control processes in the brain that connect and then prioritize and help us integrate our cognitive functions moment by moment. And the metaphor I've used to think about that is if you picture a symphony orchestra where all the musicians are soloist quality, really very good players of their instruments, regardless of how good they may be, if you do not have a conductor who can select what they're going to play and who can keep them on time and bring in the strings and then fade out the strings and pull in the timpani and bring in the brass and organize them and stop them and start one, out a good, without a good conductor, you don't get very good music out of a symphony. And the fact is that ADHD uh, is essentially a problem in those aspects of brain which function as the conductor of the brain symphony in daily life. Slide, please. 
So what we're talking about is that we could write an equation that says ADHD equals the developmental impairment of the brain's self-management system, its executive functions, its neural networks that deploy and manage a whole variety of skills. Uh, and I emphasize the word developmental because it's highly heritable and it is usually seen as a delay in the development of those specific cognitive functions, even though the person who has ADHD is likely to have very good or at least fully adequate uh, functions in the other aspects of, of, of brain control. Slide, please. Next slide, please. This is repeated. Okay, now before we go further, let me emphasize that there are uh, a couple of things that's important to know about uh, the characteristics I'm, I'm about to describe. One is that this is a dimensional disorder. It is not an all or nothing thing. By that, I mean it is not like pregnancy. If you are pregnant, you are not pregnant. There's nothing in between. It's more like depression, where everybody gets bummed out once in a while. But just because somebody's feeling sad or unhappy occasionally for a day or two doesn't mean that we're going to say, oh, we've got to treat them for depression. It's only when the depressive symptoms are persistent and making a lot of trouble for somebody, we say, yeah, that's a depression, and we're going to do something about it. Now, the next element of this slide, please, uh, is one which I will talk about in just a few minutes in more detail, but let me just flag this issue, and that is that the most puzzling feature of ADHD is its situational variability, and the fact is I've seen thousands of children, teenagers, and adults with ADHD. Every one of them has at least a few things, a few tasks or activities in which they have no difficulty exercising those executive functions that are problematic for them in many different ways. More about that very shortly, because it's, it's to say that ADHD may appear to be a willpower problem because of this feature, but it's not. Slide, please. I, I, okay. uh, I can tell you that when we meet uh, in my practice, I meet employees and the, the manager has something to complain about. They use uh, phrases like, well, if he just wanted it enough, that's for me always a signal. Mm, this might yeah. be something to do with ADHD. If pe people around them are talking about their will and their motivation, etc. Yeah, that's exactly the issue. And we'll be talking about that in just a few moments. Uh, but I, meanwhile, I'd like to invite you to take a look at this diagram. Uh, let me say a few things about it. I'm not going to talk about each piece in detail. Uh, I have published uh, books about this, and you will find on my website uh, more explanation about it as well. But uh, along the bottom row you see there, the words activation, focus, effort, emotion, memory, and action. And I'd like to emphasize that these are not self-contained aspects of brain. These are aspects of brain functioning, and that most of the time, they, most activities that require executive function involve interaction of several, if not all, of these different things. Activation is about getting organized and getting started and figure out which things need to be done first, second, and third, and getting going on it. Focus picks up issues of being able to focus. Uh, and sustain the focus when you need to, but also to shift focus when you need to, so you don't get stuck on one thing uh, to the exclusion of other things that need doing. Effort talks about regulating alertness, and that includes, among other things, difficulties in falling asleep. Often people with ADHD will say, you know, I often stay up a lot later than I really want to or should, because I find if I try to go to bed before I'm really, really tired, I can't shut my head off. I just keep thinking of stuff. And so I often stay up late uh, and, you know, doing reading or, or watching TV or, or uh, gaming or whatever. And then uh, when I feel really tired, then I fall asleep without much difficulty. Of course, the problem then is often leaves them with very short nights and makes it difficult during the next day. Uh, and also processing speed, the, being able to slow down when you need to slow down for whatever you have to do versus, uh, you know, being able to speed up for other tasks. The official diagnostic criteria for ADHD include nothing about emotions. But those of us who are researchers and clinicians working with people who have ADD, 
uh, are generally quite much, uh, quite aware of the fact that for most folks with ADHD, managing frustration and uh, modulating emotions so they don't just take over too much of one's functioning is an important part of ADHD. Because the people who have ADHD often will tell you uh, it's different emotions for different people. Sometimes they get really worried about things more than they need to be. Others, uh, they get very angry, very irritable over minor things, you know, even though it doesn't last very long usually. Other times, uh, they may get caught up in a, a, a feeling of demand of there's something they want to do and they want to have it right now. Uh, these emotions of frustration and anger uh, or desire and longing uh, or fear, uh, what happens is it's something that's described often by people with ADD as though it's as though uh, there's a computer virus that just invades the entire hard drive and it takes over too much of what I'm thinking or, or trying to do. Yeah, ab absolutely recognize this also. Uh, uh, emotion is one of the standard issues you have to address and uh, especially when it's uh, becoming a sort of theatrical uh, personality disorder. Yeah. And uh, I don't like that disorder, but they, the psychologists call it that. And uh, very, very, very important subject indeed. Another very important aspect uh, of, in ADHD uh, is working memory. If you ask somebody who has ADD, how's your memory? Often they'll say, oh, I have the best memory in my family. I can remember stuff nobody else can remember. They give you some examples about some movie they saw 10 years ago. Uh, and they're able to tell you every detail of that story, of that movie, the story, the whole storyline, even though uh, they hadn't seen it uh, in the intervening 10 years. However, or somebody else might say, oh, I have in my head 450 songs that were popular back in the 70s, all, of your, all, all the song of it and all the, the lyrics of it. But even though they might be very good about remembering things like that from a long time ago, if you ask them about something that happened just a couple of moments or yesterday, often they can't tell you. The problem with memory in ADHD, it's usually not long-term storage memory. It's much more frequently short-term working memory where you have to hold on to one thing while thinking about something else. And then finally, uh, action. And there are some people uh, who are some kids uh, who are, this is of course the first earliest recognized characteristics of ADD is that there are some kids who have ADHD who are are very hyperactive. Uh, you know, I've had women who have said this one was hyperactive in the womb. Uh, you know, the, the child who's always moving around. Uh, but and there's some who, as adults, if you sit with them and have a conversation, their knee is bumping up and down and maybe vibrating the table, uh, or they find themselves just talking on and on and on and not giving anybody else a chance to speak. Uh, regulating action is important, and for some people, the difficulty is in slowing down enough, and the other, in other cases, it's a matter of, of uh, speeding up enough. But what you see here is just a simple model of the multiple aspects of ADHD which does not correspond to different parts of the human brain. It talks about the way in which the brain organizes itself and its neural networks in fractions of a second to deal with whatever the challenges are that happen to be coming in the mind at the moment. Slide, please. Now, this is what I was alluding to uh, a moment ago when I spoke about the situational variability of the symptoms. Uh, and this is the central mystery because it really puzzles people when they notice about themselves or about someone else who has ADHD that they may be able to focus very well uh, while they're playing football or while they're doing video games or while they're making art or while they're making music or while they're cooking a meal. Things that they ha are working at without the distractions and without the difficulties that often are characteristic of the person with ADHD. And so you, you ask them about it and say, hey, what's with this? How come you can do it here and you can't do it here, here, and here? And usually what they'll say is something like this. It all depends on how much it's interesting to me. If whatever it is I'm interesting, interested in, uh, I can do that and I can focus on it. But if it's not something that I'm really, really interested in, 
Uh, unless it's something where I have that feeling that I have a gun to my head and that if I don't take care of this right here, right now, something I do not want to see happen is going to happen, uh, then it, I'm not able to do these things. And so if it's something that a person is really interested in or if they're really afraid that if they don't take care of this right here, right now, uh, something they don't want to see happen will happen, then they find the motivation. However, if it's not something that meets one of those two criteria, for people with ADD, it's often very difficult for them to motivate themselves for these for various other tasks, even though they recognize that the task is something that's important for them. And slide, please. One of my college student patients uh, gave me an example. He said, you know, I have a sexual example for you for what it's like to have ADD. And I was interested in this because people often talk about, well, it's just a matter of willpower. And I think this example uh, picks it up in, in a way that fits better with the experience of people with ADHD. He said, having ADD is like having erectile dysfunction of the mind. If the task you're trying to do is something that turns you on, if you're up for it, you're able to focus and get things done. But if it's something where you do not have interest in it, if it doesn't turn you on, you can't get it up. And if you can't get it up, you're not going to be able to, to move forward with it. And I would offer this to you as a metaphor for thinking about the difficulties that people with ADHD face. That there are times when they may very much want to do something and feel it's important, and yet at the same time, they're just not able to make it happen. And it's not about willpower. It's a problem with the chemistry of the brain. Slide, please. Could we change the slide, please? Okay, as I talk about ADHD as, as a chemical problem, uh, Basically, what I'm trying to emphasize is that the most effective treatment for ADHD is to improve the chemistry of the brain with medication. And many people, you know, if you go online to look up what can you do to help ADHD, you're going to find many suggestions about improve your diet, get more exercise, uh, you know, follow this or that uh, regimen. But the fact is the science that we have where we evaluate various treatments for ADHD basically shows us that the most important factor for improving the difficulties which constitute ADHD is to address the problematic chemistry. And without addressing the chemistry, some of these other interventions that are proposed are not likely to be very effective. Slide, please. Let me just say a few more words about the, the medications for ADHD. One is that they have been demonstrated safe and effective. You know, now, the fact is that there is more research on the medications which are approved for the treatment of ADHD than on any other medicine you or anybody else is ever going to take. And that's precisely because we use them with kids as well as with adults. But the other thing that's important to know is that there are many prescribers who have had very little preparation for being able to understand and treat ADHD and who sometimes do not realize that determining what is the effective dose for a person does not go as it can for some medicines by a milligram per kilo formula, which is to say the amount of medicine that you need for ADHD does not go by how old you are how much you weigh or how severe the symptoms are. It's how sensitive is your body to the, to this particular, your particular body to this particular medicine that's being used. And that's why uh, I would emphasize that in order to get an effective dose, it's necessary to have fine tuning of what dose is being given and when it's being given. Because for example, the duration of action of a medicine is not the same for every person taking the same medicine. And the, the time frame uh, for which you want to prescribe, whether it's being given once a day, twice a day, three times a day, long acting, short acting, or some combination, uh, these are all things that have to be taken carefully into account. And so it's very important if one is going to use these medicines 
that you have some help from a prescriber who understands ADHD and understands the importance of fine tuning the medicine to the body chemistry of whoever the individual is, regardless of their age. Slice, please. This diagram, if you use your imagination a bit for a moment, think about the fact that everybody in their brain has over 100 billion neurons. These are tiny, tiny cells that are all packed in our, our head. And they are so small uh, that each is about two thirds the diameter of one human hair. But they're amazing cells. And they carry electrochemical messages, low voltage electrical impulses uh, that allow us, whether you're talking about wiggling your finger, walking across the room, reading a book, driving a car, riding a bicycle, or eating a meal. All those functions are controlled by networks of these neurons. And the thing that's most interesting about them is that the messages are carried. And if you look at the, the upper part, uh, what you're looking at here is the the end of the this is the end of the a particular neuron meeting the other uh, the end of another neuron and the gap in between is called the synapse and what this artist is trying to represent here is the fact that when the electrical charge comes zipping in through the neuron and it gets close to the point where it's going to jump over and remember how small these are they need a chemical there are 50 of plus chemicals that the brain makes that are called neurotransmitter chemicals. The one that's most important in ADHD is dopamine. And so that's being manufactured in little bubbles like you see in the picture here uh, on the sending side. And you see only one of them here, but the fact is there are many. Uh, and so when that electrical charge comes, it releases micro dots of that chemical. And that allows the charge to jump across and hit what you see is looking like blue torpedoes on the other side. These are the receptor cells. And they don't look exactly like the picture, but this is simply a way of making the point. And if you get enough of the charge coming across that gap and hitting enough receptors at the same time, it, not, it zips on to the next place and gets to where it's got to go in order to make things happen. If there's not enough of a charge coming across in that way, then the person's not gonna have much interest in it. Now, these red uh, objects that you see that are penetrating from the side on the sending side above, those represent the transporters. And these are tiny little cells uh, that serve to, as like little vacuum cleaners uh, to suck up the chemical after it's been released. And if you need that, it's very important because if you don't have that, uh, you're not the whole system is going to be blocked and you're not going to get anything else through. So the the way in which the medication works, and whether we're talking about the amphetamines or we're talking about methylphenidates, what what they do, what the medications do, is to allow the slowing down of the pullback of the the chemical charge. Uh, by fractions of a second to give it a better chance to land and be received. And without that, many people with ADHD are able to get good activated response only if the th matter that they're looking at is something that's really interesting to them. But uh, you need the medicine's help to make those signals go through better for other things that may not at the moment be all that interesting, but they may be important to the person. Slide, please. I'd like to, to make one more point about medication because sometimes people will say, you know, I tried that medicine and it seemed to be helping me a bit, uh, but then uh, near the end of the day, uh, it, I didn't feel right. And what I'd ask you to do is think about the timetable, which is represented by this diagram where you can see first the medicine is kicking in where it says ingestion and it's gradually getting up to the point where it'll be uh, activated. And if during that time which you see the, the sign active, the time the medicine's supposed to be working, if during that time the person is feeling wired like they've had way too many cups of coffee or really crabby, like every little thing is pissing them off way more than it ought to or would usually, or 
if they may be able to focus, but they get too serious and there's a kind of blunting of their emotions, they lose their sparkle and people might want to say to them, hey, are you okay? What's the matter? Any of those three things, if they show during the time the medicine is supposed to be active, and this obviously would be a longer time or a shorter time, depending on whether it's long acting or short acting medication. If they occur during that time frame, it's likely that it's the wrong medicine or too big a dose. However, if you don't see it during the time the medicine's supposed to be active, and you do see it happening during the time you'd expect the medicine to be dropping off, that's a completely different problem. That's what we call a rebound. And what it means is not that the dose is too high or too, uh, you know, just not the right medicine because it's been working earlier. What it means usually is it's dropping too fast and it's more like dropping off a cliff than it is going off a smooth exit ramp from a highway. And usually that can be fixed quite easily with a small dose of the short acting version of the same medication uh, that is being given in the first place. So it's very important to think about if a medicine's not working, when? Is it during the time the medicine's supposed to be active, or is it something that's supposed to be uh, a smooth uh, exit from the medicine and it's hitting too fast? And the latter usually can be fixed pretty easily. A slide, please. But I'd like to, to make a note here to say that education about medicine is really important. And the thing that I'm trying to emphasize is the need that the medicines have to be fine-tuned in collaboration between the prescriber and the patient. And prescribers need to help patients understand that they need to fine-tune this. It's not simply, okay, here's the pill, take it, and then everything's going to be fine. We need to get adjustment of dose and timing to individual needs and the individual body chemistry and try to prevent rebound and encourage people to report side effects. If that's done, you've got a much better chance of the medicine being helpful. Slide, please. Now I'd like to shift to another important topic uh, that I'd like to address today, and that is that ADHD, whether you're looking at it in little kids, teenagers, or adults, tends to have something else in the package. For example, what you see here is the results of a study of adolescents, 13 to 18 year olds, a very large number, over 10,000. And the percentages you see are what percentage of those adolescents who had ADHD had something else with it. And you see about 14% had some kind of mood disorder, 31% about an anxiety disorder, some behavior problems with about 20%, substance use disorders with drugs or alcohol, uh, about 11%. And eating disorders, two per, uh, you know, about two percent, and then any disorder, just about fifty-fifty. And you can see along the bottom row there, somebody having one of these problems, fifty-eight percent. Two of them, more complicated. They've got to about twenty-four percent, and then there's a smaller percentage, approximating though twenty percent, uh, who have uh, three. So the main thing is when you're looking at somebody with ADHD, it's important to keep in mind that along with ADHD, it's quite likely that they're going to have another problem that also needs to be given attention. Slide, please. Now, on this slide, I'm asking you to think with me about a variety of different uh, functions that have to do with autism spectrum disorder. And please bring up the other parts of the same slide. Um, and we know that among those with ADHD, uh, they're about 12, depends on which study you look at, but about 12 to 18% of people with ADHD also have at least some traits of autism spectrum disorder. And that uh, when you look at a sample of those who have ADHD, who have autism spectrum disorder diagnosed, depending on which study you're looking at. It could be between 30% and about 85%, but I would say it's much closer to 70% or 80% or uh, than it is to 30 or 40%. Now, what does that mean? What are we talking about? We're talking about people who have significant difficulties in their relationships with other people, who tend to be weak in being empathic in terms of being able to empathize for what another person might be thinking or feeling. Uh, they're likely to have difficulties in being able to 
uh, read other people's communications, not so much understanding their words as the nonverbal communications, the ways in which the raised eyebrows or facial expressions uh, are putting in added meaning to what the person is saying. And uh, the impact uh, in also using that kind of communication themselves to let other people uh, see something of what they're feeling as well as what they're thinking. Uh, often those on the spectrum also have a lot of difficulty developing friendship and very pragmatic language. And they're also characterized by having very strong interest in a few specific things uh, and not much interest in a lot of other things that people of comparable age uh, would be expected to have some interest in. It. Now, I think it's important to recognize that there is a spectrum. The reason they talk about the autism spectrum is that there's a wide range of severity and that there are some on that spectrum who are born with intellectual disability and are not able to, to learn language well. And there's some others who are in the average range in their cognitive abilities. And there's some who are extraordinarily strong. Some need very strong school supports and social skills instruction. And some go to college and university and function quite well, except for the fact that these issues tend sometimes to get in their way, even though they may not be intruding on their academic work. Slide, please. Okay, let me go back to the previous slide, please. I uh, didn't, didn't mention things. Uh, what In terms of other things that we can do for people who are on the autism spectrum, and I'm talking now about Asperger's, which is the term that it's no longer in the diagnostic manual. I think that's a mistake that ought to be changed. But the fact is uh, it's a way of referring to those with average or above average IQ who are also are on the autism spectrum. And the fact is we've got good evidence now that the ADHD symptoms uh, that uh, many of those on the autism spectrum have right across the board from the low IQ to the high IQ uh, often respond to stimulants in terms of their ADHD or sometimes to, to atomoxetine. And then if they ha also have a lot of difficulty with obsessive compulsive disorder or anxiety, we might use some SSRI medications like uh, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So what I'm proposing here is that when we're dealing with people who have autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, which many of those people on that spectrum disorder have, it's important to pay attention uh, to providing adequate treatment. Slide, please. Uh, one, qu one clarifying question from the public. What do you mean by pragmatic language? I'm talking about pragmatic language uh, to refer to just being able to talk with people about daily interaction uh, and to distinguish the psychotherapy that would be done uh, from exploratory psychotherapy where you're digging in and trying to learn about underlying unconscious motives and about the dynamics of relationships with one's parents, instead to talk about what kinds of issues the, this particular person's running into in getting along with other people in their school or other people in their work or, or daily life, and to talk with them about pragmatic ways of addressing these things to compensate for their difficulties. Okay, and thanks. perhaps, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, perhaps uh, it's easier if we uh, can look at a couple of specific examples. Uh, this is about Sam. Uh, this is one of the uh, 12 cases that I talk about in my new book, which you'll hear about a little bit at the end of this presentation, uh, where I'm talking about ADHD and Asperger syndrome. Uh, and all 12 of those case examples, which are some children, some adolescents, and some adults, all 12 of them uh, have both ADHD and also impairments of autism spectrum. I, I would say Asperger's. And uh, when this 12-year-old boy was brought in by his parents, he was doing okay in his schoolwork, but he was getting teased a lot and often made trouble uh, for himself by being too critical of other kids. And the parents were saying, you know, we try and tell him not to do that, uh, but he just can't keep his opinions to himself. He's always quick to point out when another kid makes a mistake, not only during classes, but also in the practices. He was uh, 
you know, engaged in, in baseball and basketball teams and was critical of, in those two. And the parents had brought him in because he was starting middle school in a couple of months. And they were really concerned about how he was getting along. And what became clear is that as we had a conversation in my office with the parents and, and with Sam, uh, his father was sort of waving his finger at him and saying, you know, you get teased by these other kids uh, and, you know, for things that you say which are critical of them or where you say to them that they've made a, a stupid answer to a question or something like that and think that you then should be talking to them about explaining it. And the fact is when you do that to other kids, uh, what happens is they feel like you're pretending to be the teacher and you're putting yourself like a big shot above them. And the kid, in his response, Sam, said, I'm just trying to be helpful. What's the matter with trying to be helpful? And it was very clear. He did not understand, even regardless of his father repeatedly telling him, that that kind of criticism or correction of his classmates was not going to be well received by them, and it was going to lead to more of the kind of teasing and frustrating actions from others uh, that he was complaining often about. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a grandmother who's talking, and uh, her child was in middle school, her grandchild, uh, grandson, two years ago, she was saying that she's talking about what it was like uh, when he was in middle school, that he was struggling. Anytime a teacher pointed out even a minor error in his work, uh, that he would be, now remember, we're talking about fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And anytime a teacher pointed out even a minor error in his work or suggested adding more elaboration in a paper, the kid would start crying and walk out of the class and unwilling to discuss the matter. And there were times when he was banging his head against the concrete wall, walls of the school. He was never a troublemaker, but he was painfully shy and very withdrawn from other kids. And what she said was that uh, she now, looking back on two years of treatment, with the support from his teachers and the medications that he had to address his underlying ADHD, at the time she was speaking, he had just completed his first year of high school with all A's and B's, was no longer engaging in that dramatic behavior which called so much attention to himself by his peers. And it actually made several friends. And in the, in the book, I talk in, in considerable length about the, the various supports that were important to help Justin to be able to make that kind of transition. Slide, please. So what do we do for treatment for those with, with ADHD and Asperger's syndrome? One important part of it is to educate the patient, the parents and other family members and the teachers so they've got some understanding of the dual load that this particular kid is, is carrying. You want to provide adequate scaffolding and personal support, especially when they're dealing with new situations like moving from one grade level to another or from one school, like middle school, into a high school or from, mid, from high school into university. And then you also watch for teachable moments to help those with Asperger's syndrome to improve their understanding of what's other going on in their interactions with other people. And then I would say important too is fine-tuned medications to alleviate the ADHD and if needed to deal with the, the additional problems that may be uh, co-occurring. Slide please. This is a statement from some researchers uh, at Harvard University who had completed a study uh, where they found that a very large percentage of children who had been brought into their clinic for autism spectrum disorder had not been recognized. 71% of them had ADHD and over 40% of them had never been recognized as having ADHD. And they wrote this caution. They said, you know, failure to recognize ADHD, especially in intellectually capable kids with autism spectrum disorder, the ones we're talking about as Asperger's, can seriously undermine their educational and social functioning, worsening already compromised social performance, and can predispose these kids 
to increased risk for disruptive behavior disorders, mood disorders, and also for substance use disorders. So it's a way of saying, hey, look, you know, unfortunately, sometimes clinicians will notice the one big problem, which seems obvious when they see the person for the first time and miss some underlying things that are there that need also to be addressed. And it's very much an issue for those who have ADHD and may not have it recognized because they've been identified as having autism spectrum disorder. And I would say to you, I see the same thing with people who are identified with depression, with anxiety disorders, with substance use disorders, where sometimes they have underlying autism spectrum disorder as well that has not been recognized, even though uh, it was very much a factor in their functioning. Slide, please. So basically what I'm trying to, to get you to think about today is that ADHD can be recognized as a developmental impairment of executive functions of the brain. Slide, next, next point, please. Uh, that it often looks like it's a problem with willpower. It isn't. It's really an inherited problem in brain chemistry. Next bullet, please. And that medications may help to deploy. I, I say may help because, you know, we're not saying that we can always get an effective medicine. You know, regardless of what the disorder you're talking about, we don't have a, a, a success rate with medicine for 100% of the people who have it. But they, they may help and very often do help to deploy uh, the person's abilities and to make them more available to learn the skills they need. Next bullet, please. And that often ADHD is accompanied by one or more other disorders like anxiety, depression, Asperger's syndrome, which require adapted treatment to deal with both sides of it. Next slide, please. And that untreated ADHD tends to make autism or other disorders much more problematic for those who have them and also for their families. Here you see the books which I have published on ADHD. Uh, the, rows along, the, the row of books on the bottom uh, talks about different aspects of ADHD and comorbidities. Uh, the one on the bottom row, which is uh, the second one in from the left, uh, Smart But Stuck is about emotions in uh, teens and adults with ADHD with 12 case examples. And then the one that's above is the new book, which will be released next month, and it's available currently on Amazon, uh, ADHD and Asperger's Syndrome in Smart Kids and Adults. And these are tales of struggle um, and of support and of treatment. And I would invite you to take a look at, uh, at any of these uh, that interest you. Great. Thank you so far. And we are looking forward to your, your book. Your book will be out uh, by the end of August. And we've been looking it up at uh, Amazon. It's already there to be pre-ordered even. Um, I've collected some questions from the public. But first, uh, to all our visitors in the public, please put your questions in the comments and uh, Phil, you and I will select them to pass it on to you. Um, first, I have some questions we pre-collected. Um, the first thing that came up in my mind was how to make a difference between a high IQ, a pure high IQ, pure ADHD, pure autism, and how to recognize autism and ADHD. So it's all about what they say differential diagnosis uh, because well we, we cannot call everybody who has adhd who is a bit not so social uh, say oh well then it's also autism how, how what are the detect detection criteria or the diagnostic criteria i think that that the, the what's important to say about it is that this kind of clinical diagnosis is something where it's not done with some simple rules it's a matter of the clinician, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the primary care physician, or whomever, uh, having a sense of what ADHD looks like, but also having a sense of what anxiety disorders look like, what yeah. depression looks like, what substance use disorder looks like, what specific learning disorders and reading, writing, or math look like. 
and learn to a invite the person to tell you about the things they're struggling with uh -huh. listen carefully and then ask questions to probe to get some sense of where the difficulties may lie because even though the executive functions that i showed in that diagram are little boxes these are just baskets of related of difficulties course. and in the same way uh persons with adhd uh are often having struggles with a number of other things and uh they may not always be able to recognize all of what's going on and that's where the clinical training of the of the uh, person who's trying to help them is so important to listen to see where the struggles are and also where their strengths are yeah Chad, um, today i'm sort of uh, because you you were talking about this overlap of autism and adhd i sort of feel like a coach i'm a coach in daily life as i uh, introduce myself um, let's say tomorrow uh, a person uh, an adult comes in and uh, already has a, a diagnosis of ADHD. Okay, we double check it. ADHD is clear. But then what do I have to look at? What, where do I have to be alert when this uh, to detect autism? I mean, detect is what the coach does. Diagnosis okay. is what the doctor or psychologist does. Okay, so, well, what, what I would... Uh, one way that I try to address this issue is I'll often ask the, the patient and then uh, whoever may be with them, a parent or a close friend, uh, but I always ask the patient first. If I were talking with friends, classmates, or coworkers of yours and ask them to describe you, what do you think they'd say? Hmm. Because in the way people respond to that question, Often you'll get clues about the specifics of things that people like about them and things that people find difficult about them. That's one of a variety of ways of, of uh, listening and inviting elaboration uh, by the, the identified patient and also whoever has come with them. Yeah, so uh, that would indeed look like uh, oh, oh. When a, a person only can repeat literally what other people have said, as if it comes from his or her memory, that might be an autistic trait. But uh, if they don't have too much empathy and don't don't are not able to think what others think about them, is that something you also listen to? Sure. Ah, yeah. So that's how we uh, we sh we. We make a difference between ADHD and autism. Yeah, because sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, sometimes it's both. Yeah, that's that's and sometimes the there are two or three other things yeah. that need to be recognized yeah. as well. And of course, you're very right that we have to refer to a, a, a doctor, a, a, a trained psychologist, or a trained psychiatrist. But in the Netherlands, and I know all over Europe, as a professional or as a person, the person, him or herself. You have to look for a doctor who knows enough about both traits to really diagnose you. And they're not always easy to find. Yeah, that's the problem. So that's why I start to try to dig in a bit more into uh, how can we make a difference between autism in ADHD? How can we recognize it? Mm -hmm. So uh, asking what uh, what do you know that what. How yeah, well, there are rating scales. There are rating scales that can be used. Yeah, um, and uh, they can be of some benefit. I've mentioned some of the rating scales that could be used for autism spectrum, and specifically for Aspergers in my new book, uh, and in my books on ADHD. I talk about the the several different rating scales. I've published a rating scale on ADHD called the Brown Executive Function slash Attention. Uh, rating scale and th those are normed for different age groups so you can make comparisons yeah, between yeah. other 10 year olds or, or other 20 year olds or other 40 year olds and get some sense of, of uh, how this person seems to have similar or different difficulties uh, than people with these other diagnoses. Yeah, yeah, we sometimes use the autism questionnaire, the AQ. A ADOS, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So uh, of course there are questionnaires that a coach also can use to to sort of uh, well, what I call detection. Someone has to bring it up. Hey, John, you have ADHD, but you might also have autism. If nobody brings it up, it will never be discovered. So that's yeah, the, and then you don't get adequate yeah. treatment. Yeah, so that's the problem in daily practice. Yeah, sure. And uh, <clears throat> uh, by the way, it's a small thing, but do you recognize the 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 sensibility for sound, like they call party deafness? It's 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 the contrary of deafness. It's uh, party overwhelmingness, uh, being in a in a room with uh, let's say a reception or a party, and uh, uh, not being able to follow a conversation because of the noise all these people make. Yeah, well, think- that that partly is is an auditory function problem, and some it's also something that you see with some people with ADHD. Yeah, uh, because it's a matter of being able to hold to the focus of the person you're talking with directly, and to exclude uh, information that's coming in other people who are chattering nearby you. Yeah, and you see, I, I think that's a, a very important point uh, to think about. Not only when you're in a crowded room with a lot of people talking, but that when we talk, for example, about focus as a characteristic of uh, focus problem is a characteristic of ADHD. It's not about focus as in zero in on one thing, like you know, focus a camera lens to be able to get a picture of one specific, specific thing. But it's more like focus on your driving. Because when you're focusing on your driving, you're not gluing your eyes to the bumper of the car in front of you. You're watching what they're doing, but you're also checking your mirrors. Yeah. You're also noticing a truck is backing out of a driveway. You also see a few pedestrians running across the street to catch a bus. You notice the stoplight down in the corner is changing from green to red. And you got to get your foot off the accelerator and move it over toward the brake. And meanwhile, you may have to shift lanes to make a left turn. And while you're doing all that, ignoring some things, keeping in mind others, rechecking others, you may be thinking about what you're going to get when you get to the grocery store. You know, and so there, you know, people with ADHD often complain of difficulty in being able to do that sort of sorting things out, ignoring some things, and then tuning in on other things uh, yeah. in a whole variety of daily life. Yeah, yeah, sure. I like that uh, that that uh, the words you used in the beginning in the executive functions, the the management of the brain, the manager, the director. That's uh, managing all these different impulses and uh, necessities. That's uh, yeah, and it changes moment by moment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's life. It, yes, it is. As do the changes of of the situation. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah. Um, again, as as uh, for the coaches in the public, or the psychologists, or the doctors, uh, whoever is there. Uh, about detection of ADHD and uh, when when a person has ADHD and autism, does it does it help to look at talking literally? They talk literally, and otherwise, when I, I as a coach talk to them, does it help to talk literally and not in too much uh, metaphors? Well, I think it it probably it. it, it... It depends on the age and the the education and the uh, cognitive abilities of the person you're talking with. Uh, sometimes a simple metaphor uh, can be a big tool in helping somebody understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. And there are other people where it uh, it muddles things. But I would emphasize uh, especially the importance of listening. Listen to tone of voice. Listen to nonverbal behavior. Listen yeah. to which things people follow up on and which things they drop immediately. Yeah, sure. That's very important. Yeah, and and um, then uh, you, you already mentioned medication. Are there other ways to uh, presumed medication? Okay, I'm, we're at the same page there. But next to medication, are there and an, any interventions? Trainings, sure. therapies. Uh, okay, well, it, uh, I mentioned earlier ed- the importance of education 
not only to educate people about the medicine, but also about the nature of the difficulties they're facing. Yeah, yeah. And then to get them to, to talk with you about the degree to which your representation to them of what you think the problems are fits with what they see. Yeah. Does it make sense to them? Yeah. You know, and then inviting people to give you some specific examples of things they're frustrated by. Um, and sometimes you want to get into psychotherapy where you're exploring the reasons for things and the, their reactions and assumptions about other people and about themselves. And other times you want to be a little more didactic in terms of focusing attention on, okay, well, uh, you know, how? To, uh, let me give you one uh, other example. Uh, I was talking uh, just a couple of weeks ago with a, a young boy and his parents, and uh, they told me about a situation where three boys uh, had come abreast walking down the hall as classes were changing, and they all deliberately bumped into this kid, knocked all his notebooks and, and uh, books out of his hands. They're all scattered all over the hallway, and the boy was complaining that, that not only did they deliberately bump into him, but they also, nobody helped him to pick it up. And uh, I inquired about what had been going on uh, early in that day with those kids. And he said, well, uh, in class, we had had an examination and uh, the three of them were talking about how they thought it was so difficult and that they were afraid that their grades were going to be poor in it. And I heard him talking about that. And I just explained to them that I didn't study at all for that exam, and I thought it was pretty easy, and I thought I it gave good answers to all the questions. And his father said, can't you see it? That when you embarrass people like that and you annoy them, they're going to feel much more likely to do things like knocking your books out of your hand. Mm -hmm. Because the kids then said, you just, you just read too many books. <laughs> when in fact, the issue was, uh, that he was too unable to read the disappointment in these kids and the fact that they had studied a lot for this exam and felt like they had done poorly on it. And then he's bragging about how he didn't study at all for it and was confident and probably right that, uh, that he did understand it all. It's, and then take that kind of a situation apart to help the kid to understand better about how this behavior is going to impact other people. And I've got a bunch of examples of things like that in each of the 12 cases. Yeah, uh, sure, in the book. sure. Great. Yeah, I think that would help people a lot to see real practical examples, of course. And uh, because I like what you say, my name for this, explain the brain. So ask for situations and then you explain what the brain does in mm -hmm. case of ADHD or autism and refer to what do you recognize and how can you work with it. So that's great. Uh, you also mentioned, as you noticed, I, I, I uh, re already reacted to that. You know, you mentioned uh, emotions as one uh, regulating, emotional regulation is one of the executive functions. Yes. Is there, uh, next to medication again, is there any other, uh, and, and then explain the brain because when your client comes in and talks about and yesterday and I bumped into the wall at blah, blah, blah. And I've thrown things around the, the place. Then you can explain the brain, but are there any other trainings okay. or therapies? I don't do a lot of explaining about the brain. I, I just try to, to increase understanding of why people around them are reacting the way they are or why they're defeating themselves. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I may be using information I have about the brain, but very rarely do I get into explaining physiology. Yeah, that's a bit too much, maybe. Yes, I, yeah. uh, I don't mean it's but too the, much. But the other thing is that uh, the medication is important. Yeah. But it's not just taking medication, but it's getting medication fine-tuned uh -huh. to this individual's particular needs in body chemistry, and then not assuming that you've got it fixed and then it's going to stay fixed, that you want to watch it, hear a little bit about how it's how the person's responding to it and what they like about it and what they don't like about it uh, so that you can see and help the prescriber, if you're not the prescriber, uh, to uh, understand what some of the difficulties are that may warrant some changes in the medicine. 
increasing the dose, decreasing the dose, switching to another medicine, adding another medicine to it. Okay. Um, let me present one of the questions from the public. Uh, uh, Kim says, the complexity of it all strikes me. What practical guides can you mention to support teenagers coping with their traits? Maybe coping with their grades? They, their, their traits. Their traits. Yeah. Okay. Uh, usually I begin with what people tell me about why they have come to see me. Because I, I, I let them tell me uh, what they're having. And for example, if, if you've got a kid coming home from school uh, and is uh, annoyed about the fact that they got a low grade on a test, you know, then I'd certainly ask about, well, why did that happen? You know, what, what kind of problems did you run into? Well, maybe uh, the kid might say, well, you know, I was writing too slow and uh, they were collecting the papers before I had a chance to say all the things that I knew. And in that case, for example, this might be somebody who needs some accommodations of extended time for taking tests. It may be that, uh, that uh, you know, they'll talk about, the, I go back to the example I just gave about the kid who had said, oh, it was an easy test, I didn't even study for it, uh, and getting him to tell about what else had happened that day before the kids knocked the stuff out of his hand provided the information about what they might have been reacting to. You know, because the, the patient, if you listen carefully to the person who's talking with you, they will tell you uh, indirectly, if not explicitly, where the trouble spots are. Yeah, sure. And then invite them to elaborate insofar as you need to know more about it. Yeah. And, and what this Kim asked, uh, the, are there any specific books on teenagers? Or I'd say you go into teenagers with ADHD and Asperger, so I'd promote your book for it. Uh, is it is is it all well, about I adolescence think, also, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes. I think the book are uh, if if it's dealing with a kid who's got or an adult who has Asperger's, the new book uh, has a lot of examples of those cases. But the one called Smart but Stuck: Emotions in Teens and Adults with ADHD has a lot of examples, very specific examples. Okay. And how uh, to work with it. Uh, and then, uh, for example, Russell Barkley has published a number of, of very good books uh, about uh, working with teenagers or uh, with other adults who have ADHD. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, one question, uh, I think we have to answer that. Are there any clinics in Europe already educating on differential diagnosis, ADHD, ASD, and high IQ? Well, not so many. <laughs> you will have to look very... Uh, you, it, it will take you a lot of time to find the right. Yeah, but there, but there are there are researchers in London. There are researchers in the Netherlands. There are researchers in Germany, uh, yeah. and uh, some only see research patients. Uh, but there are others who, if you ask around, and I would think that one of the services I don't know enough about how Autism Europe operates, or about how Addis operates, but I would think that they would. Uh, if they don't already have it, uh, be promoting listings yeah. of uh, centers uh, that you have reason to believe uh, and individual clinicians, if need be, uh, to be able to say, okay, this is a place where they have some well-trained people trying to do some good work with adults with ADHD yeah. or with uh, teenagers or with young children or the full range. Yeah, I don't know if Phil, you can tell that about the UK, if Edis has such a list. I know the Dutch association has such a list. Uh, here, uh, the question was about clinics who uh, are into autism and ADHD and high IQ. And more and more clinics are going, uh, are specializing, at least in the Netherlands, and I think in Germany as well. It's the ADHD clinic. And then you have to go, after that, you have to go to the autism clinic etc. So that is a bit of a risk, let's say. Well, yeah, but I think I, I, don't, I can't answer uh, for what Addis does or doesn't have in terms of a list. But what I would say is that some of those clinics that are advertising as ADHD also, I would expect, would have experienced clinicians who know damn well that 
you very rarely see plain vanilla ADHD. We don't exactly have a list, as it were, but um, we do have some of the uh, clinicians that our members and our and the people we speak to have been to, um, and lots of them increasingly are dealing with um, people with autism and ADHD. Okay. But the, the general route in the UK is through the NHS, and unfortunately, it does mean that your mileage varies based on where you're living in the country, and how experienced your general practitioner is, how experienced the services you're being referred to are, unless you go privately or unless you go through uh, a service which can offer private services to the NHS. Yeah, I think in each country it's very important to collect information about which clinics, which clinicians uh, are have been recognized as doing a good job with different yeah. aspects of ADHD with and without co-occurring conditions yeah sure yeah th th i know that we, we did it in the netherlands uh, but we do it more and more but uh, you know the, the these associations are a bit afraid that they will be responsible for the information yeah you have you know? to the only way those lists can work is if you have a disclaimer on it and say look yeah we have gotten good feedback on these people but you have to use your own judgment uh in uh in, in dealing with them directly yeah that you're not putting an imprimatur on them, but you are making a very available information that these people say they provide this service, and you've had at least a few people who've been there who say, yes, it seemed to work okay. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm I'm legally trained, so this a good disclaimer will help, of course. Uh, back to the content. There was uh, one, uh, one person said, I'm an autistic doctor, and I have... Uh, so I have autism, but I am, have also extra empathy. So uh, I know worldwide there's a, a, a running uh, sort of conflict or discussion about people with autism do not have empathy. And the new school says, well, people with autism are perfectly capable uh, to have empathy. What's your opinion on that? I think we have to go on a person by person basis. Yeah. And uh, in, for several reasons. One is that, for example, the, the research on long-term development with people who are, who are diagnosed as having um, autism, uh, there are some who, as they get older, uh, the symptoms diminish and they gradually uh, develop more skills. You know, and then there are some who continue to have great difficulties uh, right from the get-go. And I, I think it's just very important to uh, to take each individual person as you know a person who's going to have certain combination of strengths and difficulties, and uh, you know the and keep in mind that the diagnostic categories we have, you know, these are committees put these things together, and it talks about what patterns have been seen, but in the end the critical number is always one yeah. when you're doing treatment for something like this. You want to, to try to get to know this one person as best you can in the context of family and work and school that they operate and try and adapt whatever you're trying to do uh, to what they're facing and where they are in their own development. Yeah, sure. And until the time that there are really scientifically uh, uh, underbuilt uh, biomarkers, we will have to do it one by one and really look into the person. And even yeah. when there are biomarkers, we still have to look at the person. Yeah, we still have to remind people that the biomarkers are not fault, fault proof. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, but it's the same with uh, a certain Jane who says, I have Asperger's, but understand metaphors. So, well, yeah, and, and in fact, I've had a number of autistic patients, Asperger's patients, who have made very good use of metaphors. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's it's important not to assume that uh, somebody who's having a diagnosis is going to tell you an awful lot about their strengths and difficulties. It tells you what neighborhood you want to wonder about, yeah. uh, but it doesn't tell you yeah. exactly what address this person's living at. Yeah. That, but then, well, my, my my coach brain says, if it's not metaphors and it's not empathy, then 
is there is there one or are there one or two criteria that may conclude this is autism in ADHD we're talking about? Or is I it's, I, it's I would always... just go back to the question of I don't I don't uh, make a diagnosis and then treat a uh, and treat a, a diagnosis. I treat people. Yeah. And I try to learn as much as I can about the person I'm talking with and the immediate context in which they're operating, family, friendships, school, work, and try and learn about where does it hurt? Where is the, where is the struggle? And then try to, to bring whatever resources I have uh, to try and address those needs and see if there are any things that we can find that would be helpful to them. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Um, there was another question about uh, pathological avoidance. So that's uh, uh, avoidant personality uh, in relation to ADHD and autism. Uh, well, yeah, that that is, there is a, uh, a diagnosis called social anxiety disorder. Yeah. And that's that's a category which is really important and really quite common. Uh, it's there, you have generalized anxiety disorder, which often involves being nervous about a whole lot of things. Uh, but social anxiety disorder is much more specific. And it has to do with worrying way too much about what other people might be thinking of you and about you. And uh, that that then often leads to a pattern of avoidance because I'm afraid that these people in this restaurant I'm about to walk into are going to think I look weird or and I'm not well dressed or, or uh, you know, that there's something wrong with me. Uh, and then the person often pulls into themselves and then, uh, you know, ends up coming across in a way that, that uh, other people do have some reason to wonder about them. You know, so social anxiety is one of the most common comorbidities with ADHD. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important to, to look at that. But each of the other different co-occurring disorders, for example, show me a nine-year-old kid carefully diagnosed with ADHD, and I can tell you that that kid has double the risk of having a drug or alcohol problem at some point in his or her life if they are not treated with medicine. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they're particularly, you know, uh, protected from having difficulty with that if they are on medicine. All it tells you is what probabilities are. Yeah, yeah, not for this person, but the probability, the statistics. Here's here's an interesting story of Sue. I think we are still not great at recognizing what's commonly known as the more typically female type of autism. I still meet all the criteria for autism diagnosis, but have huge strength, including consultation skills and get very good anonymized 360 degrees feedback from patients, relatives, and colleagues. I think because it's been one of my special interests, so I've got very good at it. Yeah, there well, and, and the, these people who have these skills, they're, you know, they're pretty impressive. Uh, and I think there's much to be respected and, and, uh, and often not so much to be treating, although what I can tell you generally in the population of people diagnosed, so diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, that um, the girls, females, often uh, are spoken about as though they are camouflaging. That's the, a, a word that's used sometimes uh, to talk about they're not showing some of those symptoms which make uh, males who have autism spectrum disorder uh, more recognizable, and I don't. I don't think of that as as a problem. I think uh, you know what we're looking at is a problem of, of uh, people who sometimes have to work very hard to try to fit in, and not to be seen as oddballs. Yeah. Um, and to be able to pull that off is not an easy thing to do. The problem is that sometimes the price of doing it is to pretend that they're that you're somebody quite different from who you really are. But I, I think that that this example uh, of this woman who is just asking this question is a good reminder that there are many strengths 
in people yeah. who may have autism features or Asperger features or ADHD uh, that uh, need to be appreciated and celebrated. And uh, I, for one, am, do not engage in treating people who are not coming because they've got a problem they want some help with. Uh, I think that for many people, uh, those strengths are impressive. And uh, yeah. I have met such people, a lot yeah. of them. Uh. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I try to do in talking with each new patient is not to simply hear about what problems they have that brought them in to see me, but also to understand and appreciate what some of their strengths are because I find that many of the people I see who come in seeking help have done amazing things to be able to get to the point where they are. And for them, the asking of help is, is a, a matter of their strength, that they have come a long way. Sure, sure. That's, that's why we have this new vibe called neurodiversity, and uh, which I hope will keep the balance between the burden of ADHD and autism and the strength and the qualities of it, yeah. as long as it's, it's in balance. I agree. And, uh, and of course, uh, for, for your clinic as well as uh, mine in, in Rotterdam, of course, we get people who come in who have a problem. If they don't have a problem, they won't come in, so we don't meet them. We're right. a little biased. <laughs> but uh, in the end, I hope that every, like you say, in every uh, trajectory with a patient in your case, or a client uh, in my case, uh, we we uh, we will also go into the strengths, and I I deeply respect that you mentioned the, all these qualities. I've read a few pieces of your book, which you shared with me. Thank you for that, and you also emphasize the 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 the, the strengths and the qualities, the super strengths sometimes, or this very good strength. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, I'm going to have to stop soon, uh, and I would like to uh, ma mention, if I may, uh, that on this slide, which is still on the screen, uh, you can see uh, the uh, web address for my clinic, which is located in, in uh, California. Um, if somebody's looking through, there's some uh, papers, some of the papers I've published uh, are available there for people to download uh, without charge. And then uh, there are all sort of these books and, and resources that you have. And I would like to say thank you uh, to those of you who have put on this webinar and given me an opportunity to, to talk with uh, all who have come. I'm yeah, grateful well, for those who, who attend. Oh, we do have to thank you, uh, Thomas, because you went to a lot of trouble and uh, your presentation was really very specific and very clear and thank you for answering uh, patiently all these nasty questions I've been asking you but you're not nasty no um, anyways we hope to see you back again in uh, I hope so in one of the other subjects and uh, thank you so far for thank you indeed time. thank you very much both of you thank who you. helped to make this thing work uh, and for everyone watching at home, um, those of you who've asked, uh, though Thomas's slides won't be available, you'll be able to access this webinar at any time on the link on Facebook or YouTube that you clicked on it with. So after after we're finished, you'll still be able to access it, go back through it at your leisure. Yeah, so you don't need the presentation. You can find it on YouTube on our Broadcasting ADHD Europe YouTube okay. channel. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank Peter you, Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.